Good morning, everybody. Dan Bates, President and CEO of the Greater Hamilton Chamber of Commerce. And once again, we are here with Coffee <clears throat> and Conversation. Uh, today, we have a really exciting presenter, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but let me tell you how this works in case you're new with us. Coffee and Conversation is a Zoom meeting, so if you have questions of the speaker, you can ask during the, either by raising your hand, or I think Mike will be okay if you just interrupt him and ask a question. Um, if you're on Facebook Live, type those questions in and Tiffany will repeat them so the speaker can get them answered. Uh, once this session is over, it'll be posted on our YouTube channel, so you can watch it at a later date or share it with others. And I'm sure there's information in here you're going to want to share. So. Um, Mike Dingledine is with CDA. He is local architect, historian, uh, Mr. Hamilton. So anybody that wants to know anything about Hamilton, they always go to Mike because he usually knows. So um, you know who I am, you know who our speaker is going to be, and I'm sure he'll do a little bit more to introduce himself when the time comes. We're going to do self-introductions so we can find out who all of you are. So Laura, are you doing the introductions? Yep, I can do that today. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Laura Merrill with the Greater Hamilton Chamber. Glad to have you all with us. Um, please tell me your name and what company you're with. Chris Cannell, we will start with you. Uh, good morning, I'm Chris Cannell. I'm with the Hamilton City Schools Coordinator of Community Outreach. Glad to have you with us today. Thank ben. You. Hey, good morning all. I'm Ben Cornish with First Financial Bank. I am a community outreach um, officer and financial wellness specialist. Glad to have you with us. Great to be here. Jill. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jill Cates with Easter Seals Redwood. Um, I am the workforce developer for uh, the WIOA Youth Career Connection Program. Glad to see you again today, Jill. Kyle. Hi there, my name is Kyle Spear. I'm with uh, New York Life as an agent with them. Uh, recently had moved to the Hamilton area and trying to be a little bit more active in the community and really happy to find uh, the chamber here and meet all of you. Glad to have you with us, Kyle. Nancy. Good morning, I'm Nancy O'Neill with the Greater Hamilton Chamber. And Tiffany. Hi, I'm Tiffany Grubb, I'm Director of Membership and Marketing at the Greater Hamilton Chamber. All right, glad to see everyone with us today. Mike, we will let you kick it off. Thank you very much. So um, I was walking down the street at Operation Pumpkin when Laura grabbed me and said, would you do this? And I said, sure. Um, and this is actually a, a conversation I started when uh, we were the architects of the Fitton Center back in 1992. So it goes back a long way. And obviously the Fitton Center is one of the most you know valuable pieces of our arts and culture. Um, fabric in Hamilton, uh, but I realized it goes way back. And so I got very interested and, and, and did learn a little bit about the history. Um, I'm, I don't know if it's Facebook or me. I'm just having trouble changing. Well, let's, let's, let's try and keep going. See, it's going now. All right. So um, I was very surprised to learn that Hamilton's most important day uh, of its history uh, was in January of 1845. Who would have thought? and um, some very um, intelligent and creative and skilled engineers uh, decided that the, um, the Great Miami River, which north of town about where Camp Camel Guard is today, was 29 feet higher than it is downtown. So they cut um, canals through uh, the, from the camp down to the, to the river uh, in town and created a really incredible hydraulic canal. And so hydraulic power decades 50, 60 years before electric was available in any cities in the Midwest uh, was the way Hamilton was founded and started. And everything that happened in Hamilton was accelerated uh, because of the hydraulic. So Niles Tool Works, you know, surprisingly, this is a great picture of its heyday. Uh, it, it was at its time and it's a, the largest tool and die company on the planet Earth. It wasn't the largest tool and die company in Southwestern Ohio. It was the largest anywhere in the world. Um, and German engineers uh, emigrated here to start this company um, and worked at it and made it what it was. Uh, and then much later, more near the turn of the century, Champion Paper became the largest coded paper company in the world. Again, not in Ohio, not in America, in the world. Uh, and all because of water in the Great Miami Buried Aquifer. So the hydraulic and the aquifer became the basis for all of our um, 
industries. Black Clawson was a company that made the machines that made the paper. Those machines um, were uh, created off of machines that were made at Niles Toolworks. So Hamilton is one of those companies that made what it made, what it made, and, and they all they all trace back to another Hamilton company that made it possible. And Schuler Benninghoffen made the woolen mills that were the, the belts that were on the paper making machines. So again, paper and tool works became kind of the basis for Hamilton, but everything came from that uh, were large, large, large scale interest industries. And in fact, in the 20s, um, about 30% of Hamilton's population worked in the paper industry. Um, so it was an incredible at the time. Um, why I say all this in a paper about the arts is the industrial wealth that came from all of our industries filtered down into everything that we did, the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, the tailors, um, the, you know, everything that we did as a city was underwritten by the industrial wealth created by those companies. And so we were a city of, you know, 100,000 people before Cincinnati or Columbus or Cleveland were, well, maybe not Cleveland, uh, but Columbus and Cincinnati. Uh, and so it was, it was all based on that hydraulic power that started it. Um, then the industrial wealth created, you know, a city where uh, the arts and culture became something that not just the owners of those industries, uh, but every single citizen of Hamilton felt like they were um, entitled to because they lived in a city that had the wealth to do it. You can tell by the architecture, and I'm an architect, so I'm, I'm jaded, but uh, we built better buildings, we had a better fabric, we had a better social fabric as well uh, in Hamilton because of industry. And so all the buildings that you see in Hamilton are so unique and so unmatched in most places in the world, not just, again, you can go to Chicago and New York and see this kind of architecture, but in the Midwest, uh, it's pretty incredible. Um, this is Richard McKinney's house, and you know, now it's a, 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 a house for just regular citizens in Hamilton, uh, but he was the founder of Niles Toolworks. This was Christian Benninghoffen's house. He founded Schuler Benninghoffen. Uh, but that's part of our fabric. It's part of who we are. Our uh, three historic districts are all very incredible housing. Again, this, this, these weren't necessarily the, the founders of the industries, but these were the engineers and the workers that came and emigrated here, like my great grandparents, um, and lived in these neighborhoods because of, of the industrial wealth. So how does that connect to the arts? So um, if you read about the history of the arts and especially about the, the public engagement, the public support of the arts, um, you know, coming up to the 1970s, it was a, it was a slam dunk. Um, we had industrial revolution wealth in America like no other country in the world. We had massive growth of nonprofits because of that. And we felt like we all deserved it. And there was no class system of, you know, that only rich people should go to the opera or only, you know, poor people should go to do what they do. It was all it was all for everybody. Uh, and so cities were very strong in terms of cultural connections. Um, so there was public funding for everything. Nobody questioned it. Nobody had to say, well, let's understand about the quality of your art or the quality of your, uh, of your ex experience to understand whether the public should fund it. There was no doubt. That all changed in the 1980s. Um, we had you know, the, 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 the bad recession of the 70s. People started asking questions about how government should spend money and how it should be accountable. And then of course, on top of that, we had things like Larry Flint saying his his uh, pornographic empire was art. And Charles Keating from Cincinnati took him on. Uh, and, and it kind of ended in a draw. But the answer in the end of the day was, OK, uh, you can decide. And the, what the famous quote was, I know it when I see it. Uh, but the government and public institutions should no longer fund the arts. And that was a huge loss for culture in general in the, in the US. It's also ironic that Charles Keating, a few years later, became the center of the uh, uh, savings and loan scandal. So he had his own problems in terms of our culture. Um, but that happened. And so what happened to that is uh, the arts um, sector of the of the US said, OK, we're going to we're going to change the, uh, the debate about the arts. We're going to make the arts public again by saying that there's all kinds of public benefit from the arts. And that's certainly a true statement. Um, but it was actually a, in the end, I believe a negative, um, but this was a great book. If you haven't read it, it's about 40 pages long and it's fantastic with the way it breaks down the value of the arts in different ways. And where the book was headed was, you know, the value of art starts very privately, very intrinsically, but it does become very public and instrumental at the top right of this chart. So when you use words like economic growth and social capital and improved health and improved test scores and education, you get a lot of uh, support 
from public institutions and you get a lot of support from some politicians. Uh, but they they didn't win the day. Uh, they did for a while. You know, this this um, arts wave in Cincinnati used to do a map of how much uh, economic benefit and growth came from their events, came from the Cincinnati Symphony, came from the fitness center, came from the Reds and the, and the Bengals and Kings Island. And it was big and it was it was real. And there was pretty much uh, data behind it. But the, the real head fake is even though they proved economic growth came from the arts, nobody cared. In the end of the day, it was much easier for politicians to bail on the arts than it was to uh, to support them. So even though there was really good black and white proof uh, for public instrumental benefits, um, it, it was a, essentially a failure. And so what really surprised people who were in the arts, if you were you know, Rick Jones at the fitness center is, at the end of the day, the private benefits are what make the, what make the arts important to us as a culture. It isn't the public benefits, it's the private stuff. And so there were books coming out on it. This is my favorite one, Daniel Pink, um, you know, who said, we're living in the, you know, the wealthiest and, and, and the fastest growing economy in the history of the world. This was the early 2000s in the tech, the tech boom. Uh, but he said, we were liberated by abundance and prosperity, but not fulfilled by it. Um, there was this whole idea of the creative mind that everybody subscribes to. But as baby boomers, we certainly were never taught it. We were never talked about it. We never admitted it. We were about our careers and our career path and, you know, our our salaries and our uh, our um, growth in terms of being promoted. Uh, we weren't about what really we all believed quietly and didn't talk about uh, was that there was a quality of life that was built out of the creative side of our our right our right brains, as Daniel Pink said, and then a. Um, sociologist, not a creative guy, the guy who does the math of social, social trends said, do you know what? Cities in the country are starting to succeed. The ones that understand that this, the ones that understand that there's a creative class and that supporting an environment for creative people is what's causing cities statistically. He's a, st a statistician. He's a mathematics guy. But he said, it's, it's really working. When I study which cities are failing and which cities are thriving in the United States, and it doesn't matter if it's in the Rust Belt or on the East Coast or on the West Coast. It's because they're attracting residents who believe in a quality of life and one that's based on the arts and a creative kind of activity. Uh, here's a quote from his book. The bottom line is cities need a people climate even more today than they need a business climate. This means supporting creative creativity across the board and building a community that is attractive, creative people. That's a big statement for the you know, 2000s, uh, especially because the tech companies were ruling the world at that time. Instead of subsidizing companies, stadiums, and retail centers, that sounds like Cincinnati, communities need to invest in the kinds of places that exceed attracting and retaining creative people. Those that nurture and creative environment prosper, those that don't fail. When this book came out, people did not believe him. They thought he was full of it. Uh, but of course, 20 years later, uh, everybody buys into that this was a fact. Um, you know, the cities like Pittsburgh that got ahead of Cleveland uh, was clearly because of this. Pittsburgh focused on their creative class environment. They focused on their parks. They focused on their uh, their fine arts uh, and their and their their quality of life. Then, right behind Richard, Florida, came sort of the millennial generation movement. That you you pick where you want to live. You pick quality of life uh, first, and you get your job second. That is so foreign to us baby boomers. You know, you went wherever your job was, and then you made your life work around that. And you brought, you brought your family in tow, uh, whatever it took. But creatives in the millennial generation are saying, no, you pick where you want to live. You pick your quality of life. You know, the live, work, play. You pick the live and play first, and the work comes second. Uh, and that, again, helped fuel how fast cities recovered who were, who were sort of immersed in this idea that Richard Florida had started. And so any city that you saw succeeding usually had a, um, a, 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 a substantial plan that said, we're cognizant of live, work, and play, and it's part of who we want to be. Um, and the city of Hamilton was so lucky, um, this is pre-Joshua Smith, mind you, uh, that we had an arts and culture identity already. Um, we had, the, in fact, we had the trifecta in Pyramid Hill, Fit and Center, and City of Sculpture. These are all three very much public arts uh, organizations that work 
in concert with each other. They're very different to how they uh, interact with the city. You know, Pyramid Hill is a visit kind of place. City of Culture is kind of a, a drive-by kind of place. And the Fitner Center is both. It gets out from its boundaries in terms of the building, and it has all kinds of activities in its building. So we had it going really well. Um, and in addition to that, if you looked, it was really easy to find that we had way more than just the trifecta. We had other organizations that were succeeding uh, massively and look at River's Edge and how quickly Adam uh, built that into what it is today uh, from a very, very small start. This is one of my favorite quotes, John Adams, second president, Federalist. I must study politics and war that my sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, dance, tapestry, and porcelain. I mean, this is a guy from you know, the founders of the country who you thought of as you know, a, math a mathematician, a politician, uh, you know, a war expert, uh, the, the writer of much of the Federalist Papers, all those things were what he was thinking. And yet even back then, there was some sense that we knew about the idea that um, our goals we're not, um, we're not based uh, on a life without a quality of life based in the arts. Really fantastic that this was something that was occurred to somebody like John Adams that long ago. Um, and then um, we have a city that's based on a, a lot of art. It, this one goes back to the turn of the century, 1906. One of those German engineers who came over here to work um, uh, also was an artist in metals. And we had a competition and our city logo is still one of the few I can find in the world uh, that is based on a, a piece of sculpture. So in 2000, when the new city uh, government services center was being dedicated, uh, a handful of people got together and said, we should become the city of sculpture. We should start to do something uh, that promotes public sculpture because one of the major pieces of this dedication was the new sculpture in front of the, the government service center. So Bob Taft declared us the city of sculpture. And from that point on, now, we were attracting uh, more artists, more attention, uh, focusing on it ourselves as a group of people in the City of Sculpture Board, uh, but finding that you know, we are per capita one of the you know, highest densities of public sculpture um, in the country. Um, and certainly we don't have the number of pieces that you would find in Santa Fe, New Mexico, or in Charleston, South Carolina, but those are bigger cities than we are. Uh, and we're right there with them in terms of our, our density. Uh, I love this picture. This is the cast of Hamilton from Cincinnati coming up to, to pose in front of Alexander Hamilton in the city of Hamilton. Uh, so a, a great uh, thing that they that their attention came to this. I think it was Ian that, that worked on letting them know that this was a, that the largest rendition of Alex in the world. Uh, and they just they came right up and spent the day uh, in Hamilton. So the city sculpture proliferated. Uh, we have over 61 pieces of public sculpture. Um, and from that, Street Spark launched, and now we have dozens and dozens of public murals. Uh, and so public art is something you can't miss in Hamilton anymore. Uh, the scale of it, the intensity of it, the quality of it, uh, you can't miss. Uh, and I think it's surprising to, to, that if you, if you try to pay attention to missing it, you realize everywhere you look in Hamilton, you're exposed to some amount of public art and, and a quality of life that was built around that success. Uh, and so um, it's fantastic um, to be watching this happening uh, in our city. And then if you want to see one of the most incredible collections of art and nature in the world, again, uh, go to Pyramid Hill. Uh, and what Harry started, you know, was started small, but it's become you know, one of the preeminent collections in the world, especially one that is so uh, couched in a natural setting and such a beautiful natural setting. And so the art out here, um, again, is is some some of it is exceptional, uh, no matter where it's placed. But when it's placed in this environment, it becomes more than exceptional. It becomes you know incredible. And, and a trip out here and a day spent out here, you need a golf cart, and they have them uh, because it takes so long to get around the property. Uh, and this Alex Lieberman sculpture was one of Harry's favorites. Uh, it is incredible that this sculpture is it's very famous, and it's in Hamilton, Ohio. And I don't know I don't know how many people in the world know know it, but I do know that a lot of people from Cincinnati come to Hamilton because of Pyramid Hill and then find out that we're also the city of sculpture. We also have a fitness center. We also have ballet and uh, symphonies and everything else here in Hamilton. Uh, but this context um, is fantastic. And I don't know, uh, there are some outdoor sculpture parks around the world. I've been to some in New Mexico, uh, but they don't rival Pyramid Hill. They don't even come close. 
And then in five short years, I guess it's now at seven short years because the first year was 15. Um, we've created an outdoor live concert venue that was rated in the best outdoor concert venue in Cincinnati. And again, talk about engagement of the public and talk about community engagement. Uh, you know, this is more intense because it's more dense and it, because it's an event. Um, you know, we assume we we did count one year at the fitness center many years ago. We had over 100,000 people cross the threshold at the fitness center. Uh, I think Adam has gotten, you know, more than that, maybe 200, 250,000 people come to the summer concert series uh, and comes from 30 states, seven countries. I mean, it's amazing the, the pull uh, that we have in terms of what we're doing as a little city in Midwest. And here's the, here's the other part of that book um, that talks about how you engage people and why the arts is a very great tool for engagement. Um, it goes from a very passive, non-intentional experience. That they call it ambient. And this is the driving by Alexander Hamilton. You do that every day. You can't not notice him. You do notice him. And it becomes an experience. And it does become something that may move you up the ladder. And so, you know, uh, civic engagement is, is really a stepping stone. It's really a ladder to something where you become engaged, you become involved, and you actually then participate. You become an artist. Um, and that's the whole idea of public art as you engage the citizenry in a way that is very slow and very intentional, but with small steps uh, that builds you up to uh, becoming a fully engaged person in your community um, through the arts. And so the theory and the thesis here of this presentation is, you know, the arts are an incredible tool for engagement. Um, and one of my favorite, again, this sort of rivals Adam's concert series is, uh, you know, Lori Farrar's project, at the fitness center. She had 350 artists from 29 states and eight countries send her um, you know, a mosaic butterfly during the pandemic when no one could get out, no one could participate in, in these kinds of arts exercises. She had him do it, you know, through the mail. Send me your mosaic butterfly. We'll collect it into a collection and we'll install it as an installation. I think it is the perfect pandemic project. It's the perfect proof um, that arts is an engaging activity because of the way that this project unfolded. It's just a fantastic piece by itself, but the story behind it is even more powerful. So then we got uh, Joshua here in 2012, um, you know, big change. He, he wasn't the person who was looking at the, um, the, the outside sort of quality of life stuff. He was looking at the hard numbers. How do we get Hamilton off of the negative side of the equation? He got here in time to see Beckett paper close and smart paper close. And we were, we were swirling and he got here and said, we have to, we have to abate it. So he and council created a, a strategic plan, which of course, you work, live, and play is around the outside of the of the uh, of the circle. What I really loved is the work side, add jobs, attract private investment. That's what most cities focus on, and that's all they focus on. They are the instrumental. Uh, we have to become more economically successful. But between Joshua and Council, people like Kathy Klink, uh, Rob Weil, uh, we came up with a bunch of intrinsic important things too that all uh, have to do with the ultimate result of those instrumental benefits. So if you read the center of the circle, it says create economic opportunity. That's what every strategic plan should say. Economic opportunity is the engine. But the way they su supported economic opportunity was connecting people, building a positive image and developing a sense of place. Those are all intrinsic. Those are all soft. Uh, numbers guys hate that stuff. How do you measure connecting people? How do you measure a sense of place? You can't. And so if you're the uh, if you're the creative uh, or the the CFO at Procter and Gamble, you hate that. You don't you don't do intrinsic things. You do instrumental things. Um, but the truth is, this has worked, and it's worked in a lot more cities than just Hamilton. But it especially worked in Hamilton. A couple of reasons is that we had you know an arts sector, an arts and culture sector already, one of the pieces around the wheel. But the other thing is, uh, we, we we were already ahead of the game in understanding what Richard Florida was trying to say, that we were trying to be a place that people wanted to come, not because there was great economics in Hamilton or not because there was a lot of cheap housing in Hamilton, but because Hamilton had a quality of life. And so that is where I think uh, you see the articles in the business and a uh, business courier about, you know, 80 acres coming to Hamilton and raises $160 million. And to them, it's all numbers. Uh, but to me, they didn't come here because of the numbers. They came here because of a lot of things uh, that included uh, quality of life. And in fact, finally, finally, Economic Development Week this year, this is way after I did this presentation a few times, 
said, the quality of life is the third most critical factor for seeking a new business location. So it, it finally is out there. The two sides agree. The numbers guys agree with the soft uh, intrinsic guys. Um, and Hamilton, look what Joshua and, and council did. Microgrants, bike path, parks, playgrounds, restaurants, um, you know, that is a big deal. Um, and it worked and it's proof. Um, and sometimes I believe it was never gonna, never gonna be believed by somebody who wasn't invested in it or inside the circle doing it. But now you're seeing it and you're seeing people now accept the fact that quality of life is what drove some of the things that changed in Hamilton. And if you ask the founders of these companies who I don't believe came to Hamilton, I mean, I still personally am shocked that the companies this size, and these are international, made this place, Hamilton, Ohio, their international center of operations. Uh, it's crazy. And then just like the industrial revolution, you know, the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, all of the projects that came behind that sort of push with those big companies, it just starts to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. It just starts to add more and more things. And again, look what we're adding, restaurants, apartments. Um, that's exactly what we need to support quality of life. And so how cool is it that the, the things that are happening behind the wave of big companies, um, you know, like Barclay Card, is that there's more services. There's more things supporting a quality of life. Um, whoops. So I'm go back. So you can see that around the circle, I'm going to touch on one more besides the arts. And just sort of, because I think it's quality of life based, is the retail restaurant and entertainment and, and Main Street, especially. So, you know, we had we had downtown Hamilton really working. We had a lot of things happening. We went from 2% occupancy in our downtown buildings to nearly 100%. I think we're at 98% right now. Um, and that's an incredible feat, but we were still not doing it in Lindenwald and Main Street. We were still trying to figure out how to pull them up from a, a, a deeper bootstrap problem. Um, but it did finally happen. And it finally happened not by the city being the only game in town. It happened because other people started to pull up on their bootstraps and, and invest. So seeing this building saved as an architect was pretty incredible because I would have said it was hopeless. Uh, but these folks said, no, we're going to we're going to do whatever it takes. And they have and they've created a, a sense of place like no other, because if you've been here, just being outside and being in this context is a fantastic place to be. It's not just what's on the menu. And what's the cool thing about here is the menu changes every day because it's food trucks. And so the different food trucks show up and you have a different menu. Um, but what doesn't change is the quality of the space and the quality of you know the connection to other people. And that's why people come here. Uh, they don't even know what's food trucks or showed up on a certain day. Uh, and they're in a place like this. And the rest of these buildings that were, again, hopeless, boarded up warehouses uh, are back in, back in service. And the idea that we're building Rossville Flats now after we built the Markham uh, is you know, impossible to believe for me. Um, this is quality of life. And this is people picking it up and making it happen on their own. Uh, again, not the city doing it all by themselves. Um, the city you know, carried a heavy load and made some deep pocket investments in getting this started, but that's all they had to do. Um, and it worked. Uh, 10 years ago, if you wanted to eat on, on Main Street, you had Richard's Pizza. It was a good option. That's all you had. Uh, and then 10 years ago, True West became the second place you could actually eat food on Main Street uh, in the first six blocks. And going into next year, we're gonna have 10 of those places. So that is a, a pretty big change. Um, a lot of it sort of depends on, again, the big leads. Uh, Spooky Nook has in, impressed a lot of these people who are new investors. Uh, but a lot of this would have happened, I think, with or without Spooky Nook. Great article if you wanna read it. Um, Where politics can still work from the bottom up. Uh, this is Thomas Friedman, he's an economist. So he's one of those numbers guys again, uh, but he did a, a couple of things, walked around some cities and understood again, that quality of life was working and it was working because it was being built from the ground up. He called it complex adaptive coalitions. It's a mouthful, it's a hard word to understand, uh, but it is meaning that everything is connected to everything else. That you know, 80 acres isn't here and Markham Park isn't here and new restaurants aren't here and my university isn't here. Uh, all in a in a vacuum in a, in a, um, a silo. It all is connected, um, and I think that's cool. And the best thing we have done, if you're not involved yet, um, is create the most incredible adaptive coalition in the world. I think 17 strong. We are trying to build uh, things up from the ground up, from our neighborhood level. A lot of people said, you know, it's great to see downtown back again, but what about North Hamilton? What about uh, Second Ward? What about Lindenwald? Uh, what about the West Side? What about these places that aren't directly connected to downtown. 
And so it was obvious that the next step was to do an adaptive coalition and look at the, and I changed the words, you know, the grassroots civic engagement from the arts, look at exactly what 17 Strong has done. They've taken a cue from exactly what the Fitton Center and Pyramid Hill have done. And that is start people with a very ambient experience, a neighborhood cleanup. It's a simple thing. Or, a, you know, talking to a policeman who patrols their neighborhood, a simple thing that changes their level of engagement. So then they become observational. Then they become curatorial. Then they become interpretive. And now we have neighborhoods being, you know, totally engaged, totally making up their own uh, playbook. Uh, and if you haven't seen this book, this is the book that de defines the 17 neighborhoods. Um, and Lindenwald, you know, got, got to start first. Protocol is our first 17 strong neighborhood organization. They are working like a well-oiled machine now. And they, I think, are frankly the only way this happens, that we take the schooner Benninghoff and Mill that's been empty and been kind of a hopeful prospect for some things to happen in it for 100 years, um, but haven't. And now we're, we're looking at, you know, new apartments uh, in the middle of, in the middle of Lindenwald. And again, it's, it was that community engagement, that sort of level of building up civic, you know, connections with people in Linderwall who can feel kind of disconnected because they are kind of the most remote neighborhood in Hamilton, um, but they made it happen. So um, it's, it's exactly what, what we want. And this is another one. And obviously everybody knows about this, but it's connecting people and it's making things happen. And again, there's a lot of negative feelings about I, all I can read about is Spooky Nook. I'm so tired of Spooky Nook. Who cares about Spooky Nook? What the traffic's going to be? What's this? What's that? What they don't realize is there's a thousand new businesses in Hamilton uh, because of Spooky Nook. And so it, it's going to mean a lot to all of us. And so the, the rising tide is going to raise all ships, not just, um, not just the Spooky Nook ship. Um, so that's, that, that's what comes from this. So this was a um, exercise I did 10 years ago where you're supposed to write about how you see yourself in 10 years, not how you see yourself today. And it's surprising. I love to show it now because now I believe we've hit it. Um, Hamilton, Ohio is renowned as a center of art and creativity. This reputation is derived in no small part from a wealth of art seen in public places. The citizens of Hamilton and the many visitors to the city enjoy an unusual environment filled with sculpture and other forms of art placed by private and public entities. That's pretty true. And 10 years ago, that was just a wish. Through its public art, Hamilton engages itself, connects itself across generational economic and cultural boundaries, stirs people's imaginations, creates meaningful dialogue, attracts diverse and creative new residents and businesses and inspires its own progress. Hamilton is a great place to visit and to live. Now we're still coming up on that second paragraph. We have some work to do, but I think we're on the right track. I think we're moving forward and we're moving in a positive direction. Uh, you know, we still have some boundaries to overcome, but, but I believe, this is doing it. And I believe, again, things like the Fitton Center and Pyramid Hill and City of Sculpture are how we're doing it. Um, and so um, it's it, 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 this went from 10 years ago being a thesis to 10 years later being something that there's pretty much there's pretty much proof in the pudding uh, that we've made this work. Anybody have questions? Not a question, but just a comment. I have to say this is uh, uh, by far the best coffee and conversation uh, <laughs> meeting I've gone to. Mike, you always do an incredible job. So yeah, there's there's one of the early slides in my presentation that's champion in its heyday. You know, who would have thought <clears throat> they would be a total failure in 50 years, uh, and then. 20 years after that, it would be something completely different and, and maybe bigger to the city or as big to the city um, as Champion was. I, I don't think anything's going to ever eclipse Champion's impact on Hamilton, but uh, we, we've got as close as we can get with what we're doing now. Well, I can say that, uh, you know, somebody that doesn't really have a grand knowledge of Hamilton, <laughs> I actually found this to be very helpful for me, um, you know, to not only just find places to explore, but gain a little bit more about the history and uh, kind of put um, 
you know, the process into place when I hear about how Hamilton is being transformed. And, you know, I've heard plenty of times people saying that it used to have a negative light and no one would ever explain why. Um, but, you know, over that course and process and, you know, I've seen signs for things like spooky nook before, but I have no idea what it is. So seeing that and its impact and kind of like, you know, setting things in motion and keeping momentum going forward, you know, that's, it definitely paints uh, a picture for me in a, in a more informative light. So I appreciate this. Good. So Mike, have you heard, is the new opening date um, January or February? Um, I, I think they'll be fully operational by January. Um, there are events in, you know, um, in the fall still in the next month or two that are going to be a happening. Um, you know, the hotel is operating. Um, there's a volleyball tournament, I believe, in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, and so those kind of things are, are happening quietly. But I think by the end of the year, they'll they'll have, you know, everything operational in a, in a way that means it's completely open for business. Uh, Dan mentioned, um, you know, they have their schedule is 90 percent full for next year. Um, so it's it's happening, you know, even though there's still people who think it might not. And if you drive by, you don't know because it's still a construction site. Um, but it's um, it's quite it's quite it's come quite a far away. And we are we are two months from, I think, substantial completion on mill one, which is, you know, the, the last piece. Thank my you. daughter That's actually. Great news. Chris, my daughter actually has a um, volleyball open gym there tomorrow night. So they're definitely. I, I didn't even realize the courts were were finished, so that's exciting. Fantastic! And I'm I'm going to a uh, Kettering Hospital event tonight. Um, I will there. see you there. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, one more question, Mike. Uh, right. The Benning Hoffman uh, building. Yeah, it's going to be apartments and. Yeah. Uh, what's the what's the movement on that? What's when do you um, think they might break well, ground? There? This is this is the process for housing in Ohio. Um, he's going after um, historic tax credits, and you know you can apply twice a year, and it usually takes you know two years on the list to finally make the list. So. He has his options on the building. The city is holding it and maintaining it, which is, again, the only way this happens is the city puts enough muscle in it to make it happen. Um, but this is a project I think will easily get tax credits. Um, but it's just a matter of time. Once he has the tax credits, then he can start, uh, you know, expending money on engineering and design and construction. So it's it's a process of waiting, just like the mercantile was. You know, that was uh, 42 apartments in 2008. Uh, and we waited three years to start construction and three more years to finish construction. Um, and it was a little project. So they, they take time, but that's the only way the performer works is with the historic tax credits. And, and how many apartments is this supposed to be? I don't know. I think it's close to 100. It's very similar in size to you know the Markham and the, Ro the Rossville Flats projects. That's that's an exciting thing. That'll, that'll... It's incredible for, for Lindenwald. I mean, in Linenwald, when I grew up, I was born in Linenwald. We, you know, the things, the services you needed, the, the, the drugstore, the barbershop, you know, the grocery store, even the bowling alley, they were all there on right on Pleasant Avenue. It was it was Linenwald's downtown. Um, and, you know, it lost energy because it didn't have the support of, you know, enough houses, enough housing and enough disposable income. This is going to bring it all back. And so, again, it's one thing to have this cool building back in use and not getting worse and worse in terms of an eyesore. But the bigger thing is it's going to reactivate a whole commercial quarter that used to be, you know, very incredible and has become you know, kind of sad now because most of it is gone. Um, but all those things, the buildings are still there. All those things can start to come back. Well, I think it's uh, it's really cool to, to see a reuse. Um, so being a lifer in Hamilton. I remember 50 years ago, uh, that building, they manufactured motorcycle helmets. Um, my dad used to work there. Wow. So to see that thing uh, come back is, is pretty cool. Yeah. I just, what's the first book that you listed? I was starting oh. to write it down. And what was, yeah. 
This is a hard book to find, um, but it's the it's called Gifts of the Muse. And, and I have it. If you can't find it, I will loan it to you. It's an easy read. It talks about the arts. The, the two better books. Well, this is a great book to read because it's a fun book. This is an awful book to read because it's a sociologist book. It's facts and figures and percentages. And it's it's horrible. But the outcome of it um, is that there's this idea that quality of life is now causing cities to revitalize quicker. Um, and it was it was the it was the book. It was the first scientist that agreed with the sort of philosophers. You know, the, the right brain people were just obviously skewed. But the left brain guy who you know brought the numbers to the game, he, he, he really started the movement. He really changed things. And then the books after that, those are fun because um, the whole millennial generation was going there with or without Richard Florida. Thank you. Well, when you say good book, that's only 45 pages. I'm like, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. It, this is a good book. It talks about, you know, trying to find a way to convince convince politicians that the arts are valuable. Well, they, they succeeded and they failed. Um, and in their failure, they, you know, they started a new movement that, that it was it was about us individually and personally from the very beginning. So I have a question for you, Mike, and this is kind of like going to put you on the spot, but I want to read the book. Do you, are, do you think that we're at a point with everything that's going on that we could get politicians back on board um, with the arts being a priority because of, you know, all the how society socially is a total mess and maybe this could help bring it back? Well, it, it should. But I, I, I say in our current po uh, polemic and, and polarization that maybe not. We can't agree on much. So I'm sure we can't agree on fu funding the arts. Um, you know, the, the Robert Maplethorpe exhibit in Cincinnati was the beginning of the end of this whole public funding of the arts. Um, and, and maybe it should be. And, and quite frankly, if we get back into an economy that we've been in the last 10 years, uh, where, you know, it's a much more powerful and a much more effective economy, I think we can rely on private funding of the arts. I think we can rely on fundraising and philanthropy. Um, it's, it's quadrupled, you know, since this book was written. Um, so in 2004, you know, the fitness center relied on a $50,000 uh, grant from the city, a $50,000 grant from the county, uh, grants from the federal government um, and, and its own fundraising. Those all went away in the early 2000s, you know, and so and they had to because those those entities were in trouble. They, there was, you know, nobody had the budget to support the arts. And so I, I think now that it's gone it, it, and the arts haven't failed that it's gone, um, I think we're going to we're going to see more and more you know, philanthropic and, and direct private support of the arts. And I don't believe public support is going to come back. Um, I don't know if it's bad or good. Um, I think it's OK because the public debates are so idiocracy. I mean, it's just, you know, the idea of getting this, you know, in front of, uh, you know, the, the the polarization of our politics it just doesn't make any sense. That is a lot of great information, Mike. A lot of things that I hadn't actually seen before. So I think that's super informative. Anyone have any other questions? Just a reminder, this will go on our YouTube channel. Yes. Um, and I um, also, I wonder how many people heavily involved in the arts have seen this presentation. I think they need to. So we might kind of force feed them a little bit by sending that link out to them. Yeah, I, I did this at the Fitton Center at a, um, what are their Wednesday events, the, the lunch events? I, celebrating that was, Self. Celebrating Self. I did this in 2006 at Celebrating Self. And I've done it in different forms since then. I do a version of this for Nancy every year at Leadership Hamilton. Um, but it, it, it's, it's what's incredible is the story was theoretical in 2006, and it's not theoretical anymore. Uh, there's, 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 uh, you know, there's a path you can follow, and it pretty much leads to the conclusions that people were making 20 years ago. Very cool. Fantastic presentation. But then, Mike, I didn't expect anything less. So um, thank you very much. You're welcome. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Our next Coffee and Conversation is Tuesday, November 8th, back here on Zoom. Um, we're always looking for interesting, informative topics. So if you have any of those ideas, please let me know. Um, I'm Laura Merrill with the Greater Hamilton Chamber. You can email me, laura at hamilton-ohio.com. 
And looks like we will see you all in a couple weeks then. Okay. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Bye, everyone.